I can see that we are getting to the end of a fantastic uh, two days uh, conference, um, <clears throat> but we have one last session. Before we go into that, uh, you know we have webcasted uh, this conference and uh, we had a lot of uh, viewers on the, the internet. And I can also say that the webcast will be available on the avinur.no website for a couple of days for those who want to go in and, and watch some of the session and the presentations that have been, <coughs> been given. And as I can also tell that Patrick Peters has just said that, that Patrick, if you're still here, your father watched you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to tell you before the session. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, now, I will make an um, <coughs> um, intro a little bit longer than the short intros I, I usually do, only to reveal my incompetence in corporate social responsibility. You know, sometimes it's better to shut up and let people think you are stupid instead of opening your mouth and prove it. <coughs> now the idea that uh, business enterprises have some kind of responsibility to society beyond that of making profits for shareholders has been around for centuries. In our time it has been heavily debated. In the 60s Friedman held that management has one responsibility, and that is to maximize the profits of its owners and shareholders, and that social issues are not the concern of business people. Others have claimed that business people do not have the necessary expertise or social skills to make socially oriented decisions. And finally, that engaging in corporate social responsibilities dilutes the business's primary purpose. Arguments in favor of CSR is that it is in the business long-term self-interest. It may ward off government regulation and recently that it not only gives the firm competitive advantages but can actually raise profits. When your player give 10 cents for every pink lid on its yogurt cup to breast cancer, they certainly expect to sell more or not. Or when Starbucks, who recently opened its first outlet in Norway at this airport, advertises that they only use fair trade coffee beans, is it not social responsibility and profits hand in hand? Or when Lufthansa enhances its relationship with communities within where it operates by operating a community involvement program, is it not to sell more tickets, both in short and long term? So what about companies that has not created a shared value between enhancing in its co competitiveness while simultaneously advancing the social and economic conditions in given communities? What if they will not make a profit, at least not in the short term? Or what happens when global or regional economies go into recession? Aviation response to rising awareness in public about climate change has gone from reluctance and denial to initiatives and programs directed at the ethical responsibility of the industry programs and initiatives that in the short term means added costs. If the shared value between profit and social responsibility is not evident, what happens when budget cuts strikes? In short, is corporate social responsibility a constraint or is it a possibility for the sustainability for the whole aviation industry? and the possibility to distance your airline or airport from your competitors. Now, to the more competent, competent speakers on this issue. First, to Svein Molleklé, who is the Senior Vice President of Corporate Social Responsibility 
and Corporate Relations at DNV, the former Secretary General of the Norwegian Red Cross, and currently the President of the Norwegian Red Cross. Sven, please. Thank you very much, and thank you for the introduction. And I would start by saying that corporate social responsibility or corporate responsibility is how each one of us, every day, do our business. And we can't cancel that. Corporate responsibility is beyond compliance. Corporate responsibility is how we will respond to the future expectations. Remember, a few years ago in Norway, we got less tax from what we now will be put into jail for. Because we used to get something, it was an investment, now it will be to buy a position which is not in line with the international legislation and the international corruption law. So the expectations changes. And it's how we do our business. It must be long-term. It must be integrated. It must be part of business. It must be part of business review, and it's a part of the leadership and the management responsibility within the line. That's what corporate responsibility is all about. So let's uh, look into the um, new risk reality. Thousands have been left homeless in the worst flooding for over a decade. Climate change is being blamed as the fair price has plummeted, as two further arrests were made in what has become the biggest corruption scandal of the century. Consumer confidence has been shaken as further cases of contamination come to light. The rescue operation is underway after a cargo ship ran aground in severe storms. So we are all living in a new risk reality, and it's a changing world. And... Um, if you talk about dead or alive, we all remember the Enron, the biggest energy company in the world. If you went to IMD, if you went to London Business School of Economics, to MIT or to Stanford, they all said, look to Enron when it comes to corporate governance. And we remember the story. The top management did not walk the talk. They did not live their own values. And Arthur Anderson, they cooked the books. They did not tell the truth. They did not tell the reality about what was going on. And we all know Enron is not longer existing. So that has to do to walking the talk and to live over values in our everyday business. When the CEO of Statoil went into position, Helge Lund, he said that to all his employees, he said there are two things that can destroy the whole company. One, a serious integrity case, and two, a she case, where people are dying because of bad management and because we haven't done what we should have done. I come back to that when, it, uh, when I will touch upon the Deepwater Horizon in the Gulf of Mexico. So taking the global and the corporate responsibility is exactly also what um, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development do when they have managed to get more than 200 of the biggest, most, most interesting and progressive companies in the world into an organization saying we have to take initiatives of ourselves. We can't wait for the politicians. And they realize that business will not succeed in a society that fails. We are part of the society. We must take the responsibility, but we can challenge the politicians to get the right incentives and to give us something uh, to build on. Uh, for the future. It's all about the power to build trust. 
It's all about, is it possible to trust you? Can the employees, the owners, can all the stakeholders trust us in our daily business? Do we dare to invest? Do we dare to, do, uh, to make deals? Can we trust them? And that is what corporate responsibility also is all about. From the DNV side, I mean, we are an independent foundation. The whole purpose is to uh, safeguard life, property, and the environment. And our vision is to safeguard, to, to have global impact for a safe and sustainable future, and to help our customers to succeed in their daily business in that line. And we all have to identify, assess, and manage risk. Not because we are afraid of our front pages or for on, on CNE and C, CNN or BBC, but because it's right and it's good for, for uh, future uh, business. And within this very difficult world, we meet new challenges. We do not see as many wars against states, state against states. It's internal conflicts. It's new kind of conflicts. Terror, violence, difficult to find who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. And it's also difficult to get the uh, overview and to get the whole picture. It's difficult for people also to live in and to work in those in, uh, internal conflicts. And we have also, in the world today, failed states. Within maritime industry, we all realize that the maritime industry will be touched upon the conflict in Somalia, in the Bay of Eden, and in that area, and with all the piracy. As we will all be touched upon the threat of terror, we see every day what we have to go through on security and safety within the aviation industry. And last year was the first year in history where more people are living in cities than in rural areas. In 2050, we will be 7 billion people living in cities. So the whole challenge is on how to organize those societies needs us to think differently. Differently within the world, we have one globe. And we have one challenge to find the right balance between the need for energy, access to energy for all people, access to clean water, to education, to the health sector and services, all the UN Millennium Goals. And when Kofi Annan developed the UN Millennium Goals in the year 2000, he challenged the business world for the first time by saying, I don't ask you to do other business. I ask you to do your business differently. Do it well, do it sustainable, and report on it. Everyone is talking about that there is a zero tolerance for failure it's much more right to talk about zero tolerance from not learning from our failures. You can raise your hand if you have some of you never done a mistake. We do mistakes from time to time, and we accept that. As long as we try to do what we can to prevent it from happening again. When the Deepwater Horizon happened, BP immediately contacted DNV by saying, what happened? Why did it happen? Help us to find out. Because they realized the consequences of the whole company. You know that Obama was about to say that uh, BP cannot do business in, in the US. And you know that the CEO of Startall said that this is so big that if I, it had happened to Startall, we would have died. It's only Exxon, Shell, and BP that have the economy and a scale to manage. And then the authorities of US asked us to find out why did it happen and what do we have to do to prevent it from happening again. And then the oil and gas industry in Norway said, could it have happened outside the coast of Norway? 
and we have to look into that also to find out. So it's not only zero tolerance from failure, but the zero tolerance from not taking the right initiatives to learn and to take the right initiatives at the right time. So what we all have to do in the corporate responsibility is to build trust through extensive, extensive reporting. If you would like to invest, if you would like to have the best and the brightest to work for you, they would like to work within a company that take the responsibility in their everyday life. It has to do with integrity and it has to take initiatives that is beyond compliance. And if you think it's enough to say that I know that all employees within my company is doing business in line with the international expectations and declarations and standards, we know it's not. We are actually responsible for the whole value chain. Recycling and shipping is good. Scrapping is good. You have the same challenge in aviation. What do you do with the, with the airplanes afterwards? But the way it's done, it's not good. Find five faults in that picture. Hmm? Children, where do you find the helmets? How is it done? This is not acceptable. I could have said, it's not my problem. This ship is not classified by DNV. I could have said, it's not my problem. It's not a Norwegian ship. And the ship owner could have said, I have sold it. It's not my problem. But this is a challenge for the whole maritime industry. Because it can't continue to be done like that. And I know that you have a lot of the same challenges within the recycling and within the scrapping. Because I've seen some of the flights and planes in some of the areas and you have some challenges out there. So what do we do? Excuse me for that uh, in which newspapers, but I would like to say that the Telenur case, when a journalist found out that some of the subcontractors within Bangladesh did not follow the international environmental declaration, the CEO said, like many of us would have said, I didn't know, now I know, now I take responsibility and I will do something about it. But the chairman of Telenor said, we should have known. And then I will ask you, can you guarantee that all your contractors and subcontractors are doing business in line with international standards? Please raise your hand. Of course not, because it's difficult, but still, we have the responsibility within a whole value chain. And it is difficult. In all the difficult markets, in all the difficult countries, and in all the corrupt countries. Doing business like Yara did in Libya, in Gaddafi. Doing business in all the countries you and we are doing together, it's difficult. But it's not acceptable to do business which is not in line with the standards we should expect that everyone must do. And the environmental concerns is not only something you can leave to Al Gore, Pachauri, or to the environmental uh, organizations. It's our challenge. We have to do what we can to decrease the emissions, the pollution, the consumption, and to do business in the most environmental friendly way. I was actually happy at the end of the presidential campaign to see that there were at least one was because we didn't care anything, even through Sandy, about that there is a link. Okay, we have had hurricanes within US for many years, but the strength is partly because of the climate change. Two years ago, we got the flood in Pakistan, which is the biggest flood in history on the globe. And we see more natural disasters than we have seen many years. And we will see that it will increase and it will affect all of us. I have seen the airports flooded. I've seen pictures, you know. And you will accept that there will be some changes uh, in the departure and some cancels. 
uh, when you uh, see Sandy. But I'm not sure everyone will accept that some of the planes are cancelled because of some snow. If we know that it's because we are not organized well and we have not done what we should. We see some windows of opportunities. You know, there will be a new leader in China now. Elected next month or this. And one re-elected. And they have to look into the future together because we all have to uh, find uh, solutions. In this world, you know better than I how dependent we are on the IT and how vulnerable we are. Who are the owners of the information? Who take care of the information? How do we use the information? And you rightly told us today how important it is to communicate in the right way. This is also a part on how we do our corporate responsibility. And ladies and gentlemen, there are no places to hide any longer. It's only a matter of time where the truth pops up to the surface. You can try. And some of the cowboys, they try to hide and they someone managed to escape. But it's only a matter of time because all the serious companies in the world, they will look into the realities and find out. So we have to build a culture within business that is based on transparency. We have heard today why it happened. But I still wonder why did it happen? How was it possible that so many bright people from all the best universities going in all those nice suits and saying and doing all the right nice things, believing in that gentleman? How was it possible that Madoff could create this pyramid? We learned from we were small guys that the few that took the initiatives, they got the profit and all the rest of us, we had to pay. So we need people that dare to ask the good questions, to dare to think differently, to dare to take the initiatives to create a, a, a new economy that we can trust. So we at least know what's really happening. We have other challenges together. Access to clean water will be even more important than access to oil. Japan, the country in the world that is best informed, trained, and had they got the best information about earthquakes and tsunamis, even they have to ask for support from the rest of the world. And now it's question if the initiatives from the authorities and reports were trustworthy. And if not, there will be a crisis within the country if people can't trust and business can't trust the authorities taking the right initiatives in scandals like that. I will go back to Kofi Annan because Kofi Annan realized also when he took those in initiatives to the UN Global Compact. You know, because I hope that you have all signed the UN Global Compact. That means we will do what we can in daily business to support the human rights follow the environmental declarations, the ILO conventions, and from 2004, the anti-corruption declarations. And he said that it's an utopian notion to think that we can create a sustainable future without business as part of the solution. Business is, of course, key in the creation of a sustainable world. No politicians can do that alone. But we see that the partnerships is now developing between the authorities, business, civil society, and research. So what we need to do together is to create healthy markets, do business the right way, take the right initiatives. 
Someone could say that we should close the whole uh, aviation industry. That is not an issue. But how can we develop the aviation industry in a way so that we manage to re reduce the pollution, that we manage to take care of the society in the best way, manage to communicate with the stakeholders, with the society, manage to develop the technology and use the technology in the best way. That is good for business. That is good for society. That is what corporate responsibility is all about. World Business Council for Sustainable Development took initiatives to a wish in 2050. In 2050, we will be 9 billion people on Earth. 7 billion will be in living in cities. So what we have to do so that everyone can get access to energy is to do smarter, better business so that the rest of the world can get access, so that they can read and write, get education, because that's the only way to develop sustainable societies. All the stakeholders want that. So what we need to do together is to find out what can be the role of business in that. And they have pointed out nine different elements, and I will stop on uh, the one really relevant for you the mobility. How can we develop the transport industry within the world, within the new world, in a better way, which is good for business, good for society? That challenge we have to take together, and business cannot wait for the politicians, but we can challenge them to ask for the right incentives. In uh, maritime, we have developed fuel cells concepts with no CO2 emission at all, we have developed a gas-driven super tanker with no ballast water and with reduction on the CO2 uh, emission and the consumption. But I would really say to you, you have at least in the aviation industry managed to develop a slot system. In maritime, they still drive as fast as they can from one harbor to another and then they have to wait for a week or two or three. And if they had had a slot system, they could have gone slower, directly into reduced emission, reduced the consumption, and better for business. So Maritime have a lot to learn from you. You took the initiatives. And remember, we need all competences in all kind of industries, with all kind of knowledge and all kind of inputs. She is the best in maritime industry in Europe, in France, coming from Japan, a society where they very seldom ask women to take part, which is some of the reason why they don't succeed in Japan. And then don't invite people from other cultures as well to the extent they have to, to succeed. So we have to learn from uh, accidents that have happened, and we have to take initiatives. And I would just touch upon, if you allow me, a few elements from the aviation, and I'm very happy to say that we have people here also been working together with you. And uh, to see that we have managed to um, assist the industry, and you have taken a lot of good initiatives with the Boeing on the environmental certification, 14,000, the Eurocontrol in understanding the wake vortex situation for the A380. You know much more about that than I do. But it is quite interesting to see the new big airplanes and you, it's not safe to drive just behind them. What do we do? How do we deal with that? The Hanela Airport in Japan developing also approaches within to the airports to take care of the noise and everything. Working with SkyGuide in Switzerland to facilitate discussions between unions and management in the air traffic control. I mean, the whole population in Norway is also concerned about that. How do we really organize that so that we can trust that the plane leaves tomorrow on time? And they're cooperating with Avenue today on to understanding the risk picture around the Norwegian airport. We are happy to say that you have taken initiative also on environmental impact assessment study for Eurocontrol, the noise load verification for Amsterdam in Schiphol, and the benchmarking on Heathrow effectiveness in communicating the airport noise 
with the stakeholders and the people living in London. You have taken those initiatives. That is corporate responsibility. That is taking initiatives beyond compliance. That is responding to future expect expectations. And also the feasibility study for Avinoid on the use of marine algae spaces for biofuel production. Is it possible? Is it possible to find fuel which is more environmental friendly in the future? We have to look into that together. That is corporate responsibility. That is taking the right initiatives. That is eliminating risk for industry. That is really understanding that we are part of the whole world and one globe and that everything affects the whole industry before because it affects the society at large. We are part of that. We must take the responsibility together because we are linked to everything and we are an international global industry. And within that industry we see that we are dependent on uh, each other. So what we can do as part of the corporate responsibility is always look into our daily business and to improve. And the UN Global Compact is reporting on the improvements. We have to realize that things are difficult, but as long as we always do our best to improve, we are doing the best we can. And I would just by end up by saying, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your initiatives, but please remember, please remember, it's all about people. People living in the society. People that can be vulnerable. And we have to take care of them. I remember very well when the ship went down uh, close to Finland and Sweden some years ago. And when the 900 people died. And we didn't hear anything from the ship owner the first hours until we, the day after, saw the newspaper with a message to the shareholders saying, we have the insurance. You can't give a signal more bad than that. Everyone cared for the people, and they only cared for business. That is not understanding what business is all about. That is not understanding that business will not succeed in a society that fails. Take care of yourself, take care of your people, take care of your customers, and take care of the society. That is good business for the future. I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Sven. And uh, now to our second speaker. Lars Andersen Reza. Uh, I hope I pronounced it uh, right, Lars. Uh, Lars is the Director of uh, Environment and uh, Corporate Social Responsibility with Scandinavian Airlines. Um, I thought he was Swedish because he was speaking Swedish, but it turned out he has a Norwegian passport. Mm -hmm. And uh, as uh, Svein is so lucky to have a father from my hometown, Bergen, Lars has a mother from Bergen, so please go ahead, Lars. The circle is complete. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I presume I'm the last speaker today, and uh, that's always uh, the nicest spot uh, in the in the theater. Um, corporate social responsibility, dead or alive. And thank you very much for the for this presentation because you sum it up uh, very good. Uh, the extremely big challenges we have in society as a whole, and the challenges. To, to link that together with the, with the market economy and supply demand of this, the modern glo globalized society. Uh, I want to give you a little bit uh, of example of how we think, at least. We are one airline. Uh, there's a lot of airlines. Uh, I can't represent them all. But, but I want to give you some example on how we think and how, how, how we have acted throughout the years. Uh, and I will try to sum it up a little bit and talk a little bit more about the industry as a whole from my point of view at least. I, I did uh, some, uh, some digging in the archives uh, and I found uh, um, uh, 
the, the first environmental report for SAS group, and it was environmental in 1996, because that was the, from today we will do some kind of materiality analysis, and we will find out that being an, an, an airline, uh, of course, environment is the most interesting uh, aspect from the stakeholders, but uh, in 1996, I presume uh, that uh, the environmental issues was the most, also then, was the most interesting, and this is an extensive documentation that we have on our website uh, describing everything that an air aircraft possibly could emit and how we work with that. And at that time, uh, as I understand it, my predecessor, the, the main focus for publishing this documentation was to have some kind of common platform of knowledge, from our point of view at least, to discuss environmental issues further. Uh, and. Uh, of course, uh, when we talk about sustainability, I found the first one that actually was a sustainability report was in 2003. And of, of no strange reason, the, the, the main uh, illustration is of course the environment, environmental responsibility, the social responsibility, and the financial responsibility. I will not go into the financial responsibility today, um, for many reasons, but I want, I, would, I want to go into environmental responsibility and social responsibility. And um, if, if you look at our report, as it looks in 2011, uh, of course we have this very fancy sustainability policy, which actually is a way of describing that we are going to do, as you said, we want to do everything right. We do it in everyday business, there's nothing strange about this, but the thing is that there are some challenging challenges between saying what's right and doing what's right. Especially in the social areas, depending on how you judge that. Because if you look in the newspapers, at least in Sweden, and I try to follow the Norwegian as well with the heritage, uh, there's a lot of issues with, um, with uh, companies doing business in other parts of the world that don't consider the social aspects of their operations. We have this big phone company in Sweden, they are doing a lot of things uh, in, in, in former Russian uh, sta uh, states, uh, republics, uh, and we have uh, big super brands, uh, Scandinavian super brands that are questioned weekly uh, regarding their production facilities around the world. Uh, so that is a very, very important, important issue. And uh, if we look at the environmental goal, of course, um, from being an airline, as I said, the, the, from, uh, from, uh, from our perspective, that is, and from your perspective, of course, now we are, we are in the industry, but from our stakeholders, the envir environmental aspects are the most uh, that are the biggest demand, and we have three goals that are directly linked to our operation today. We're going to reduce the total emission, we're going to work with ground operations, and we're going to work with energy in our facilities. We are a huge user of cars and different type of, inf of vehicles. We are a huge user of infrastructures like buildings, like hangars, like offices. That things that you don't realize how big we are. Of course, we tend to sell most of them to other companies nowadays, but nevertheless, and that is the, the very interesting part. In 2003, we had this big hotel chain as well, and a huge amount of social issues uh, regarding a hotel in the Middle East. Of, co of course, we sold them, and of course, we are not account accountable for that anymore, that's other companies that have to, to, to deal with that. But if we sell or if we buy products and services, then we are all of a sudden responsible for something that is even more hard to get control over, the supply chain management. Because if, if we all have the management in-house, if we own the buildings, we have control over the buildings, but if we lease the buildings, there's a totally new process of the supply chain management to get that to work. So, and then of course we have some uh, more um, <coughs> other goals regarding, uh, regarding um, uh, customer perception, but last but not least, we need to have some renewable, sustainable jet fuel in our aircrafts. And we uh, have, um, of course we participate in the, in the, in the Norwegian initi initiatives, and there are other initiatives ongoing in Sweden and, and 
and Denmark and on global basis as well. But I think we're going to see that a little bit later than 2015, which are the target dates for our first free goals. So SAS has been into uh, very turbulent times. Uh, we are in turbulent times, maybe I should say. Uh, and the question is, how do you respond to that? Because it's very hard to improve your environmental performance when you are, uh, when you are downsizing the operation. Uh, and um, through, uh, through the years, uh, we can see that um, we have on the, on the left-hand side, we have billions, millions of passenger kilometers, and we have some emissions on the other side. And we see that, that if, we, if we look at the passenger kilometers, there something happened in 2008, 2009. Uh, and we are slowly uh, getting, getting back to some kind of pace. And if we look at, at the emissions, which is uh, th th those things I work a little bit more with, uh, you can see that they followed the curve. And actually, they are not uh, increasing as rapidly as the passenger kilometers. So we are doing something right. Uh, in order to be able to fly more with less uh, environmental impact, because we have a very big environmental impact. I would be the first to, 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 to admit that. But we, we tend to see that we are doing very good improvement. And if you look at grams per passenger kilometers, and this is actual figures that we have produced or we have distributed now to the ETS system and so forth, it's going downwards. Uh, and I, I took the liberty to put in last year's quarter to, to give you some kind of example that if we do as bad as we did last year, which was not that great, uh, we will even though be have, have a, a good improvement. So how is this achieved? Uh, and um, talking about environmental responsibility, uh, there's a lot of talk uh, throughout. I, I, I'm Maybe uh, my radar is a little bit more uh, tuned in to environmental messages uh, from all the suppliers when I do my personal my personal uh, um, uh, purchasing and do my choices in life, but I think that you see a lot of you see a lot of, of um, uh, messaging about buying new things. Uh, you can just change your you, you need, for example, in the aviation industry, we have the newest best aircrafts, uh, and of course uh, that is all, that is uh, that could be a good thing, but uh, unfortunately uh, there are more to uh, sustainability. <coughs> Uh, than actually the, the emissions. You need to look into the total cost of operation. You have to look into all aspects of op operating an aircraft and scrapping the aircraft and, and the life cycle analysis. So um, I, I will be happy to say that our aircrafts, uh, as uh, one of the big airlines in the, in the US buying our old aircraft, say that we have the best maintained aircraft because that's good for the fuel efficiency. Uh, we also change the uh, engines on the aircraft. Actually, you wouldn't see that, but, but uh, on some 737s that you will, if you fly with us, uh, I flew with one of the aircrafts uh, this morning, uh, uh, 737-800, with, with engines that are actually uh, put on the, the newest uh, 737s coming off the production line that we got another one uh, the other week. So they got the same engines on the aircraft, but this aircraft was for 98. So it's the CFM 567BE, uh, uh, maybe you know about that engine. And there's a lot of uh, improvements being done into the, inf into the systems. But we actually change the aircraft, but our customers, they just see the plate in the door that everybody looks at in 98, and that's a very old aircraft. But actually, the fuel efficiency on the aircraft, when we measure that, is not it's, it's comparable to the new one, if everything else is, is, is the same, of course. Um, and you know that we are replacing older aircraft, and that's the thing about being a mature airline. You have to do, you, you have to, to change your aircraft in, in some kind of sequence. Of course, should we only buy new aircraft, which we do, we're going to get some Neos 320s in 2016. That's going to be a big improvement, but you have to work with your existing aircraft. And you have to work with the people working with the aircraft, the pilots, uh, the ground handlers, the technicians, because um, we implemented this, uh, this might sound like a sales pitch, but we implemented a system that uses all the data from the fi flight management system. And we got these very interesting graphs that can show us exactly how much fuel we burn in different phases of the flight and why we do it. 
Uh, and when we look at, for example, waiting for gate or waiting for ground power, when we come into Arlanda or Gothenburg or Gardermoen or Ber Bergen, whatever airport, we see that there's a big difference in how long, how long time will it take to plug in the ground power. And then you could argue, uh, will, would that save you any money? Yeah, it would save us any money because if we prioritize that, we shut down the engines faster. So we can save five, four or five kilos of flight uh, by working with those kind of indicators. Uh, and uh, when we look at the, the approach phase of different uh, airports in, the, in mainland Europe, uh, you could argue, uh, you can look at the facts and figures, but you can see that we have a long way to go in order to be fuel efficient in all phases of the flight. Uh, even though we have very advanced systems, we have hundreds of kilos of fuel to save. But of course, we, we also have to realize that there are other aircrafts in the air that has to be, t has to be handled. Of course, we do we mount winglets when they it's, it's feasible. And uh, you know we don't have winglets in all our aircraft. That's because it's not feasible. It will cost us more fuel than we save by flying one hour with our, uh, some of our 737s. Then we don't do it. That's our way of taking responsibility. The customers want us to have winglets, but we won't put them on because it will, we will burn more fuel. Uh, that's a communication issue, problem, uh, challenge, whatever you will call it. But that's, that's the facts. We change chairs uh, and we work with the air navigation service providers. This is the RMP AR uh, wet dream of uh, going into Gardermoen. Uh, um, and we, but we've done some very, very f great improvements at, at Arlanda, uh, the, in the uh, curved, kind of curved approach, thanks to good collaboration. We have collaboration with Avinur, and that's because we are so big in this area and we can, of course, do that. We have a lot of people working with these issues, and you can always argue whether or not that drives cost or not, but we can see improvements uh, from working with this issue, and it's all about the balance, because you, 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 you would argue that it would cost you a lot of money to work with this, but you have to have very, very strict business cases in order to do the investments, because we wouldn't install uh, electrical nose gear wheel thing on the 737s, uh, which we won't probably because we have so short taxi times, but if you would be an airline in, in the US, you maybe would do that. But we, you have to look at everything, and that's our way of taking, taking responsibility to make sure that we do it from the right perspective and the right decision. Uh, and then, of course, looking at, the, looking at the, the flight stages and looking at all these aspects, it gets very technical sometimes, and it gets very complex, but you have to, strict it, uh, to split it up in order to to see where, it, where are the lowest hanging fruits. And there is a lot of low hanging fruits there still in order for us to get more fuel savings, less emissions, less costs, because this is all about costs and taking responsibility. Uh, and of course, um, when you look at it uh, from, uh, from an airline perspective, um, uh, it's a good thing for uh, driving business. Unfortunately, uh, we haven't seen that yet. Uh, we are certified according to ISO 14001 and the EMAS scheme as well. Uh, and uh, it's very good that within the environmental uh, responsibility part, there are very good, uh, very good um, certification available that you could use. There's, it's another issue when you look at social responsibility. Um, but I will get back to that, what, what I mean about that. And one way of, of taking responsibility, not lingering around too much exactly what we do, but, but there's a lot of discussions about uh, aircrafts and, and the fact that you choose aircrafts, what kind of aircraft would be the most feasible to use. Uh, and um, when we look at, at uh, our emissions from, um, from Oslo to, uh, to Stavanger, Sula Airport, where my father is, is born, um, you can see that when, when we look at the one-year period, uh, you could always argue that, that, um, that uh, we want to fly there as often as possible uh, because we have, we have a demand from our customers to fly often rather than seldom. Uh, and if we fly, um, we have three different Boeing 737s. Uh, we have more, but we have three different types of 737 next generation. Uh, that's the 600, the 700, and the 800. They are all represented by different colors. And if you look at the, at the emissions from, from um, 
per passenger. And th these are actual figures uh, looking into this one year. And these are figures looking into the fact that we have snow, that we have a new uh, ap approach and departure system at Garda Moon. Th this is just the real facts. Uh, you can see that if you have 100 passengers, it's not suitable to fly a big aircraft. You have to have a smaller aircraft in order to maintain uh, uh, less emissions and you have in order to fly to fly more profitable as well and of course uh, the issue with the environmental communication in the aviation industry is that you tend to always look at the hundred percent cabin factor figure that is on the far end of this il illustration so if we would fly from St Stavanger to, to Oslo uh, it would be more environmentally responsible to fly a small aircraft if we have hundred passengers uh, on that aircraft. And then, of course, you can do the math and, and, and see how, how, it, how it works. And this is our way of, of, and it's less noise as well, and other emissions of greenhouse gases. So this is our way of, of trying to figure out how to, how, to do it, who, how to do this correctly. So coming back to the question, is it dead or alive? I would say that we are progressing towards from both, because there are a lot of um, activities ongoing in this area and we are trying to get a hold of how to do this as simple as possible. There are some new, not standards, but you could, you could uh, argue that ISO 26001 uh, is some tr you're trying to get into the, the, so uh, the social responsibility aspects as well. It's so extremely hard to tr compare a factor in China with an airline in like Vidra in Norway. Uh, it's so extremely st hard to, to compare that, but there are some good upcoming uh, guidelines slash certification because we all um, we all try to, to, and being owned by the, for example, the Swedish state, we have to have a, this audited, verified uh, sustainability report according to the Global Report Initiative, which is a, a very high level of, of uh, demand, that has, that, that, which we need to do this, we would do it anyway, but, but the fact that you get your organization to work with this environmental responsibility and social responsibility is the only way forward. And I think that we will see more uh, easier way to comply and find out how to get more leverage out of your investments. We don't invest that heavily in our environmental targets because that's a way of business. And that might be the, the downside of, of, of uh, integrating hard because you want to communicate it extensively in order to get the customers. But if you integrate it, you have to have like a lifeline to the communication department possibly that you need to capitalize on this because it, it, it is very important to tell what you do to the market. So I would say it's alive, but in turbulent times, it's less communicated. Maybe I could say like that. So uh, going going back to um, going back to the, the the reporting and going back to whether or not I think I would say that I think it's gonna it's gonna grow and I think that more and more customers are gonna demand it, but we don't see it. We see corporate customers asking us, sending us questionnaires about uh, do we have child labor at our head office in Stockholm. Do we comply? Do we have union agreements? Do we have? We actually had. We have audits, not uh, every month, but we have audits. Different auditors. There are different methods. It's not like ISO 14001 coming to us, wanting us to show the salary of our employees. Uh, and when when we when we do that, of course, we comply in in all aspects. But we need some kind of, of structure of it in order to make this not that, because that's driving costs. And the only thing we don't have possibility is to absorb costs because customers want lower, lower prices. And um, obviously, uh, when it's coming down to price uh, for more leisure-oriented travel, um, it tends to be less uh, high demands on whether or not you have, you have uh, all your social responsibility aspects in place. Uh, as long as the cost is 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 uh, is uh, is, uh, is low, 
uh, without saying, but everybody is of course following le legislation. There's, there's no uh, issue about that, and that might be an issue with the globalization of, of, of the aviation industry. Uh, we are competing with airlines from uh, all types of, of countries uh, where there are other different types of, of salaries. Uh, and we are, uh, we are competing to with them, we are working together with them in, in different types of alliances, and there is no, it's like all other uh, areas, the, the, I, I presume that the salary for one of my colleagues on the uh, Thai uh, and on SAS are a little bit different, but we all comply to, to uh, our legislation that, that is present. So I would say that the CSR work is um, is idling a little bit in the communication, and I hope for all airlines that the activities underneath, inside the, the organization, is as uh, is as uh, actively as in, in our aspect in uh, within SES. Thank you. So. Uh, Thank you, uh, Lars. Um, at this time, we only have time for a couple of questions. But uh, from from both of you, I and uh, if I understood it correctly, dead or alive is not really the question. There is no alternative to continue with CSR. CSR is what you do uh, in everyday business. But I'm absolutely convinced that uh, lifting up the best practices uh, will be a good investment for business. We have seen that in a project called Sustainia. Uh, in that uh, award committee, we have uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland, Connie Hedegaard, the EU commissioner, uh, Pechauri from uh, UN, uh, and, and the chairman for that group, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and why? <laughs> because he realized that people will drive cars, people will take uh, planes, people will live, but why don't do it environmental friendly? Why don't invest in the cool, good uh, businesses and lift them up to find the sustainable uh, long-term solutions? And with those practice, uh, practices and with the good examples from business, we see that those investments are really profitable and it's good for society as well. And we see the same thing also in the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Industrial initiatives, even in the cement industry, they come together, they compete, but they cooperate. And they have managed to reduce the emissions and to do, reduce the uh, uh, and consumption, and they have managed mm -hmm. to find new good solutions together. So industry after industry, and that's also why you, within the aviation industry, have to find how can we do it uh, better way. That will be good for business. When you, Lars, your company is using resources to support Avinor in making better arrivals to Oslo Gardem uh, for um, <coughs> less pollution and, and less uh, fuel costs, uh, um, th that benefits the rest of the airlines at uh, the airport as well. Do you think it's unfair that uh, it's only SAS using their own resources for this? Yes, of course. <laughs> uh, no, uh, to be honest, um, we have the information from our aircrafts. Uh, we know exactly what they're doing, and we do a lot of flights into into the uh, Gardermoen. And I would say it's, it's it's our responsibility to share that knowledge because it's it's so much about using the facts and using the the result of all the analysis you could do. You you, you should not make it too complex, but but if we see something, we need to. If we see some ineffic inefficiency in the existing structure, we have to go for that and make some, com some decisions together in order to get rid of that. Because there are, we are all waiting for some big bang about Cesar and some big fancy solutions, but there's a lot of things you can do today in order to achieve rather, sustain rather substantial sustainable solutions that, that is multiplied by thousands and thousands that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So it could be, it could be, it's about gate allocation, it's about uh, whether or not you go right or left through to of that uh, radio beacon thing. And th th there are so many small things that can make, uh, a, a, that we don't need funding from the EU to do that, we just have to do it. And that was your point, uh, Svein, that 
you don't have to, don't wait for politicians, don't wait for regulation. I mean, what we saw in Copenhagen, I mean, can you imagine how disappointed the world was when the politicians did not manage to come up with uh, new standards, with new political solutions? But the uh, response from business was, we can't wait for them. We just have to take the initiatives ourselves. But we have to do business smarter, better, and more sustainable. And that will be also uh, profitable uh, in long term. And then we have to challenge the politicians. Uh, I just have to tell you, in Rio 20 years ago, there were five companies participating. In Rio this year, I was participating there together with them and uh, took part in some of the debates. There were 1,274 companies, and they took initiatives and were constructive and lifted up uh, new solutions we have never seen before. And the politicians have to see that, wow, they are really doing something, and we can't manage to, to agree. But they were also challenged to, to try to facilitate the good uh, sustainable business solutions. Uh, and we have to cooperate with civil society and with the NGOs uh, as well, and not at least with research. Because we have a lot of competence, if we use it, if we use the technology available already, we can find good solutions, but we also have to invest in new research to find even better solutions for the future. And that would be good business. Is, is climate uh, the, the single biggest challenge for the aviation industry? I think it's the biggest challenge for the world. And the financial crisis, uh, we will uh, manage to come through that. But if we don't take initiatives when it comes to the climate change in all industries, uh, it can be uh, consequences for all of us. So I think we have to deal with both in our daily business. Klaus? Uh, I think that um, uh, the risks about the climate change issue is that you you, you tend to believe it or not, um, or you can believe it more or less. And, and you always argue about what kind of level should you achieve at what year. For example, IATA have, have this target that, or together with a lot of other uh, organizations associated with aviation, um, the manufacturers there, the ANSPs and the airports, and they are talking about 50% reduction to 2050. And then you can argue is 50% good or is that sufficient or not? The, the, the question is not uh, whether or not sufficient, the, the, the question or not is are you going to be able to, to, with this technology you have, or is it going to be financially sustainable if the oil price increase? So it's, from my perspective, I would say that you need to do the, ch the shift in order to use the resources available. And, th and then if that has some, some global uh, warming, we, which, which we, we, we know, but, but if you look at it from the financial perspective, that's uh, the incentive good enough for me to work with this. Because if we could fly all our aircrafts October this year, 1% unit more efficient, n not by changing aircraft, but actually flying them more efficient, 1% than last year, that's a lot of money that we are urgently in need of uh, in order to make, make, make it into the future and handle the financial situation as well. <coughs> well, Lars and uh, Svein, we have to stop here. I'm sorry <coughs> for us all. Here is a uh, little instrument to measure the turbulence uh, at home. <laughs> Thank you. And the last man on the stage will be the CEO of the Arminu Group. Please, Doug. Ladies and gentlemen, dear speakers, we are coming to an end. It has been two great days, very, very interesting. I must say uh, this conference is developing uh, quite good uh, and will be back next year. We have been addressing the globalization. We have heard there is no way or no place to hide in the future for uh, a global industry as the aviation. But you also heard a stunning uh, message from the pilot union, what it means for them. They are operating in a very competitive um, environment, meaning that they have to travel and to find jobs where it is, and they cannot uh, rely on what used to be. You are uh, hired and can stay at home. Very, uh, very demanding. You also heard that 
well, what you can see is an imbalance. Some areas are quite protected. Uh, we have uh, monopolies and we have very uh, demanding situation for the airlines, hunting for uh, or striving for survival. This cannot last. It must be a balance in the future. I'm quite convinced of that. We also learned about the commercial activities, how important that is, but how well run it is, and how we can manage to improve that even better so it for the future can make uh, aviation be even more innovative, more uh, sustainable, and so we can make money and make it cheaper or even uh, better compared to other transport uh, possibilities. Uh, I must say this morning the political view also is very important. Of course, it's more important for me, maybe, because they own Avenur, but it's important for all of us. How do they see the future? And uh, we must listen carefully. It doesn't mean that we doesn't, don't have to take the responsibility, but we, and uh, especially we in Avenur, must listen carefully. What do they see? So the NSP discussion, quite interesting. Uh, I must say that um, I think we are just looking at the start of a change. I think this is only the first chapter in the ASP total makeover history. There will be a different future uh, if compared to what we are seeing today and we have been seeing in the past. This is just the start. At last, and I must say, quite interesting, especially um, from DNV, the corporate uh, social responsibility. To me, it's quite clear. There is no way to hide even here. It must be the same uh, focus as flight safety or security and economics. You have to have the balance. If you don't have the balance, if you forget one of these uh, pieces, safety, social uh, responsibility, and economy, you will lose. So it's good for business. Um, to uh, wrap it up, uh, very interesting, very uh, focused, and I must, at last but not least, thank uh, Knut, uh, Marianne, and Andrew for the well-run conference, and also hiding in the shades is uh, the team uh, led by um, Torun. Uh, who has arranged this uh, conference. Uh, we had 160 people here, quite good, I must say. I look forward to the next years. Before you leave, a few pictures here on the screen for the days that we have been through. So have a nice, safe flight back home and don't forget the tax-free. Thank you. See you next year.